Progressive Insurance. Taking the dog for a walk right past a bombing suspect who is now being hunted by the FBI. New video released by the Bureau shows the Capitol Hill bomb suspect wearing a gray hoodie and carrying a backpack wanted for leaving pipe bombs outside the DNC and RNC the night before the January 6th attack. On the front lines, inside one of the hardest hit hospitals in the East, seeing the most cases out of any in its state. The battle against the virus still raging despite the many hopeful signs that we're turning the corner and a concern over the spread of variants. It's really putting a wrench in our uh, control and certainly it's contributing to uh, this ongoing uh, transmission. It Growing concern over a surge of migrant children at the southern border. The reports of thousands of unaccompanied children now overwhelming government facilities. Texas deploying the National Guard to assist Border Patrol. The White House pressed on the issue today. So well, we've talked to them, Jim. They won't confirm the numbers. I, I would encourage you to go back to them and ask them again. We're not going to confirm them from the White House. It's not our program. It's Department of Homeland Security. Jury selection is now underway in the trial against Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer charged with the killing of George Floyd. At least three jurors have now been seated. What one of them claimed about the video seen around the world. The Queen responds, issuing her first statement about the allegations made by Harry and Meghan, how her words are being received. And Prince Charles out in public today, but mum is the word about the interview. Some consider him one of the greatest minds in modern history. Philosopher and professor Dr. Cornell West announcing he's leaving Harvard after a very public dispute over tenure. Our conversation tonight about representation in higher education. The higher levels of professional managerial sites, be it Silicon Valley, be it Wall Street, be it Harvard, too many of those sites still look like the National Hockey League. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us tonight. We begin with a new call for help from the FBI and another chilling reminder that what happened January 6th, the day of the U.S. Capitol insurrection, had the potential to be a lot worse. The FBI is now releasing several new surveillance clips of a suspect associated with live pipe bombs placed at the offices of the DNC and RNC in Washington, D.C. Tonight, the Bureau wants anyone who recognizes this man to come forward. The clip shows the suspect in a residential neighborhood carrying a backpack. In another video, the same person is seen sitting on a bench in front of the DNC where one pipe bomb was allegedly placed under a bush. A third clip shows the individual walking by a business next to the RNC. With more on just how much devastation may have been averted, Pierre Thomas leads us off. Tonight, the FBI releasing new video of the person suspected of planting those pipe bombs the night before the Capitol riot. And the FBI officially confirming those pipe bombs placed at the Democratic and Republican National Committee headquarters could kill. These pipe bombs were viable devices that could have been detonated, resulting in serious injury or death. The video offering specific detail on the suspect's movements. At 740, the suspect seen walking along this residential street. Investigators interested in their somewhat unusual gait. Moments later, a person walking a dog passes by. By 7.52, the suspect has made it to the DNC headquarters. The suspect sits on a bench and appears to fumble with that backpack. A bomb is later discovered in the bush adjacent to the bench. At 8.14, the same suspect walking down an alley next to the RNC headquarters. A bomb placed there as well before exiting the area, walking past the Capitol Hill Club. The FBI handing out a profile as it asks for the public's help. Since January 5th, you may have noticed changes in someone you know. It could be bragging about what they did while on Capitol Hill, following this story very closely, or exhibiting an unusual emotional response to the reporting of this story. And the FBI providing more details about the bombs. They apparently contained black powder. And the FBI interested in where those attached kitchen timers came from. Authorities also releasing images of the suspect's Nikes in hopes it will trigger a lead.
Perhaps those sneakers will offer some clue. Pierre Thomas joins us now from Washington. Pierre, it's been more than two months since this incident, and authorities certainly are hoping for a break in the case here. They certainly are. With so little to go on, it's hard to rule anything out, Lindsay. The urgent concern tonight is that the suspect planted, planted potentially lethal devices. I think it's fair to say that none of this more than 285 arrests made so far are as important as this elusive suspect. They just are having difficulty finding him, Lindsay. Trying to find, track him down. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. And next to the difficult process of seating a jury in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer accused of putting his knee on the neck of George Floyd. After a full day of questioning, so far three jurors have been seated in a process that could take weeks. ABC's Alex Perez is there. Tonight, jury selection finally underway in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the first juror selected this morning. You've not seen any of the social media videos or news stories with clips of the video or anything? No. Okay. I've seen the still, there's a still image that was pretty common. He's a white male in his 20s or 30s and works as a chemist. Lawyers asking about his opinion of Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I don't love the Black Lives Matter organization. I do support the movement. A second juror seated this afternoon reported to be a woman of color in her 20s or 30s. Derek Chauvin in the gray suit watching closely. He's pleaded not guilty to second degree murder and second degree manslaughter after he pinned George Floyd down for more than nine minutes. Floyd's sister Bridget says the family remains laser focused. Justice. 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 That's what matters. That's all that matters. And Lindsay, late this afternoon, a third juror described as a white male was seated on the jury. Uh, the selection process is moving along very slowly here, in part because they're interviewing everyone individually, uh, one by one, due to COVID concerns. Now, uh, over uh, the last 24 hours or so, about 22 jurors have been dismissed. Several of them didn't make it past the questionnaire process, and several of them were questioned today and were also dismissed. Now, the judge believes uh, it could take up to three weeks to fully seat the jury, the 12 jurors and four alternates. Uh, the process is moving along slowly, but he says they will keep uh, chugging along here until they get a full jury seated. Lindsay? And joining us now is Minneapolis defense attorney, Mr. Mike Brandt. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, Derek Chauvin's attorney may have shed some light on what the defense's position will be when he said that the, quote, cause of George Floyd's death is the subject of great controversy with a video that most people on the entire planet have seen by now. How challenging will it be for his legal team to possibly argue that Floyd died potentially because of underlying medical issues or the fact that he had COVID before the incident or possible alleged drug use. Sure. And it's one of those situations where at first blush, you look at the video and you wonder how could somebody possibly argue that this did not cause the death of George Floyd. However, you're going to find from the medical testimony as the uh, medical experts get into it, that what was going on inside George Floyd's body and his actual death may not be directly related to uh, Derek Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's death. In other words, there are other things going on inside of George Floyd's body. Uh, one of the big things that they've been talking about, and there was a motion yesterday that was brought up about information about whether or not George Floyd had ingested some controlled substance at the time that he was being arrested, specifically that there were some controlled substances found in the back of the squad car that he was trying to be put into that had saliva on it, suggesting that George Floyd was either swallowing, chewing, or otherwise in, uh, taking some controlled substances, which could very well have affected what happened uh, that caused his death, the actual mechanism of his death. So it's certainly challenging because that video is so damning, but you get past the video to actually what's going on in George Floyd's body, and that's where, the, uh, that's where it's going to be uh, important, absolutely. But wouldn't the question then be absent that knee being pressed on his neck for several minutes, uh, would he have died even if there had been drug use, even if he had had COVID before? And that's, that's absolutely going to be the thing that the jury is going to struggle with in this case, because you look at the video and on its face, it looks like the knee on the neck caused the death, okay? 
And so the question is, is if you take away that knee, would George Floyd have otherwise died? And that's where I think there's going to be a battle of the experts with I, the defense is going to be able to be bringing in folks that will be able to opine that indeed there was another causation of death that was independent of the knee on the neck. And that's also going to be intermixed with the issue of whether or not Derek Chauvin was using reasonable force in restraining George Floyd at the time that uh, this was taking place and whether or not this was a type of a restraint that has been used, has been used in the past and has not resulted in somebody suffocating or otherwise dying at the hands of the police. That's going to be the big issue. And turning to the jury now, three jurors have been seated so far. One of them claimed that he had not seen the infamous Floyd video, but had seen pictures. He was not challenged on that claim. You live in Minneapolis. How hard do you think it's going to be to be able to seat a fair jury? Yeah, and that's that's been there's been a lot of talk about that because obviously when this happened, number one, the, the, the proliferation of the video throughout not just Minneapolis, not through Minnesota, but throughout the world was huge. And I was quite surprised. I've been listening to the jury selection as the day has gone on, and I was almost shocked to hear that that particular juror had not seen the video, but had just seen some of the still shots from it. So do I think it's possible to pick a fair jury? I do. Um, I mean, in any, in any case, jurors are gonna come in there with certain biases. And the question is, is can they get over those? That's the question that's being asked of these. And so, I mean, slating three weeks for jury selection and ferreting through all of the different jurors is a monumental task. But as you can see from the selection today, they've been you know, doing a good job of getting through people that they just can't put those biases aside. So I think it's possible. It's a big challenge though. Of course it is. And you have the potential curveball looming over this is that possible third degree murder charge. A decision has not yet been made about whether that charge should be reinstated. Walk us through why this has the prosecution so concerned. Well, I, I don't know that the, the third degree has them concerned as much as it has, gives them another option for the jury to consider. So. The, the way I describe it, with the three different charges, the second degree, the third degree, and the manslaughter, each one of them under Minnesota law requires a different level of culpability. For the second degree, they have to prove intentional conduct. For the third degree, excuse me, for the third degree, they have to prove what we'll call reckless conduct, and for the manslaughter, negligent conduct. And each one of them is a little bit higher burden for the state. The third degree gives the state another thing to argue for the jury. So if they're struggling with that second degree, it gives them an option to still convict uh, Derek Chauvin if they don't feel that the state has met all the elements of the second degree. So I think it's important to them. And one of the reasons it's important is that the third degree murder charge, even though it has a 25 year maximum sentence, under Minnesota sentencing guidelines, it calls for the exact same sentence, 150 months, as the second degree. And so the state definitely wants that as an option to give to the jury. So I think that's why they've been fighting so hard to get that put back in. Attorney Mike Brandt, we thank you so much for breaking it all down for us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Next to the fight to end the pandemic as the work to vaccinate Americans continues, Eva Pilgrim reminds us that the virus is still every bit as much of a threat. Tonight, a year into the pandemic, the fight against the virus still being waged at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey. So these two patients are really sick. They've seen the most COVID cases in the state, no longer filling three units as it did in its peak, but still filling one and creating strains on its staff. The severity of COVID still persistent. I do see out in the public that people are more lax and not seeing behind these four walls what's going on. I think they would uh, think differently if they were able to see what we we're going through back in the ICUs. So you guys are still going through it? Absolutely. Every day. It's a challenge. Across the river, New York, now the latest state to lower its vaccine eligibility age to 60 and above. With more Americans becoming eligible for the vaccine, public health officials stressing just how much is at stake. How quickly we vaccinate 
versus whether we have another surge really relies on March. what happens in March and April. The U.S. averaging more than 2 million shots a day. Roughly 10% of U.S. adults are fully vaccinated. And now preliminary data indicates the Pfizer vaccine is also likely effective against the worrisome Brazil strain, now present in at least 11 states. And in Houston, officials saying wastewater samples show the more contagious U.K. variant is rampant in the city. The variant now responsible for one death in Connecticut, cases of the strain nearly doubling there. This as the CDC issues new guidelines saying two weeks after their last dose, fully vaccinated grandparents can visit with and hug family members that aren't vaccinated as long as they are not high risk for COVID. So this is going to be exciting after the first shot, the second shot, then we could after two weeks, we could see the grandchildren again. <laughs> And a new study that's not yet been peer reviewed found nearly 32% of long haulers had no symptoms in the first 10 days after testing positive. That means that they were asymptomatic in the beginning, but yet still are dealing with these long term symptoms. The NIH has launched a major initiative to not only find treatments, but also to find a way to prevent this. Lindsay. Eva, thanks so much. And turning our attention now to the growing crisis at the border. Today, the New York Times reported the number of children detained has tripled just in the past two weeks. So what's the White House doing about it? Matt Gutman has more. Tonight, the sheer number of unaccompanied migrant children apprehended at the border now overloading government facilities. There is a crisis on the Texas border right now uh, with the overwhelming number of people who are coming across the border. Texas deploying 500 National Guard to assist the Border Patrol. Many detained after crossing near McAllen, Texas, which we saw firsthand last week. Mauro Magdali is, is 17 years old. He is one of the uh, unaccompanied minors that uh, officials have been telling us about um, coming in massive numbers, a significant spike as they're calling it. Um, and right now they don't actually know where to put them. The problem Biden facing now, a test also for Trump and Obama before him. The number of unaccompanied migrant children detained has tripled over the past two weeks to nearly 3,500, about 1,400 of them being held longer than the three days permitted by policy. Thousands are being held in shelters set up during the Trump administration that critics have called jail-like. The Biden administration concedes there is a problem, but it has been unwilling to offer specifics, Hello. referring our Cecilia Vega back to Homeland Security. That's well, we've talked to them, Jen, they won't confirm the numbers. Well, I, I would encourage you to go back to them and ask them again. We're not going to confirm them from the White House. It's not our program. It's the Department of Homeland Security. The press secretary making a very interesting distinction there. Matt Gutman joins us now. And Matt, the president's chief of staff, Ron Klain, addressed the crisis at the border not long ago in an interview. What did he have to say about all this? Uh, Lindsay, the administration is clearly very sensitive about this specific topic. Uh, Klain saying that the administration is surging sources and resources to the border right now, trying to build out capacity. Uh, what they are really trying to do, they say, is try to house these children in a way that is both safe and humane. But right now, the vast majority of these kids, uh, 3,400 plus, are in Border Patrol facilities, which are jail-like. And the effort by the administration currently is to get them to HHS facilities that are still like detention camps, but at least much more accommodating and specifically designed for children. Lindsay. Yeah, lots of concern about the humanity of it all. ABC's Matt Gutman, thanks so much. And when we come back, the terrifying moment of bear chases a skier. Dr. Cornell West, after a very public fight with Harvard over tenure, decided to leave. Coming up, we'll ask him why he decided not to continue fighting for what he says he was owed. But up next, the palace responds to a bombshell Harry and Meghan interview. And what made Prince Charles cry today? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. 
Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched news cast number one in late night versus the competition the number one news magazine on friday nights number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition the number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news abc news is america's number one news and I understand that you've got a personal relationship with Meg Markle or had one and she cut you off. She's entitled to cut you off if she wants to. Has she said anything about you since she cut you off? I don't think she has, but yet you continue to trash her. OK, I'm done with this. No, no, no. Sorry. No. Oh, Sorry. Uh, so, do you know what? That's pathetic. You can trash me, mate, but not my no, own. No, no, no. See I'm, you later. I'm being... So Sorry, can't this do this. This is absolutely diabolical behaviour. That's now former anchor of Good Morning Britain, Pierce Morgan, storming off the set after he was called out by one of his co-workers. You just heard that there. I said former because he stepped down after the show following fierce backlash and an investigation by regulators over comments that he's made about Harry and Meghan. The fallout from that explosive interview is Im impacting British media, but it's the palace that's in a real crisis over the allegations that Harry and Meghan both made. Tonight, Buckingham Palace has released a statement on behalf of the Queen. James Longman has more. Tonight, the Queen breaking nearly 48 hours of silence, responding to those explosive claims of racism rocking the royal family. The new statement from Buckingham Palace saying the whole family is saddened to learn the full extent of how challenging the last few years have been for Harry and Meghan. The response coming after Meghan revealed she contemplated suicide and accused an unnamed member of the royal family of racism, saying there were conversations about how dark their baby's skin might be. He won't be given security. He's not going to be given a title. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? Oprah asking Prince Harry about it too. What was that conversation? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Um, but at the time, at the time it was awkward. I was a bit shocked. Um, can, you, can you tell us what the question was? No. I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing that. The Queen's statement didn't address those specific accusations, but said the issues raised, particularly that of race, are concerning, and added, while some recollections may vary, they're taken very seriously and will be addressed by the family privately. Prince Harry told Oprah the comments were not made by the Queen or Prince Philip. Today, during his first public appearance since the interview aired in the UK... Sir, can I ask, what did you think of the interview? Prince Charles dodged reporters. Sources say Prince Charles, the future king, believes diversity is Britain's greatest strength and is deeply concerned about the accusation. Tonight, crisis talks reportedly underway at the palace. The Queen's three-sentence statement ending, Harry, Meghan and Archie will always be much-loved family members. And Harry and Meghan went out of their way to make it clear they have a good relationship with the Queen.
I've spoken to more, more to my grandmother in the last year than I have done for many, many years. Do you hold Zoom calls? Uh, we did a couple of Zoom Sounds calls bad. with Archie. Yes, I could yeah. see Archie. Yeah. Um, my grandmother and I have a, a really good relationship mm -hmm. and an understanding, and I have a deep respect for her. She's my colonel in chief, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, she always will be. On several occasions throughout that interview, he suggested that he has a good relationship with his grandmother, the Queen. James Longman joins us now. And James, that last phrase in the Queen's statement, Harry, Meghan, and Archie will always be much-loved family members, is almost identical to a phrase included in the Queen's statement after Harry and Meghan announced that they were stepping back last year. That said, how are Meghan and Harry going to reconcile the fact that they say that they're on good terms with the Queen but are challenging the very institution that she heads up? Well, Lindsay, that just goes to the very heart of this entire issue. They're essentially saying, we love the Queen, but we hate everything she represents. That has not sat well with a lot of hit people here in Britain. I mean, there are a number of theories, right? I mean, what are they saying? Are they saying that the Queen is this kind of doddery old lady who doesn't realise what's happening? Are they saying that somehow she's being manipulated behind the scenes? Are they saying that she just doesn't know? She's not aware of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I, I found that a quite a difficult difficult thing to reconcile and I think in their interview it was difficult to kind of follow that rationale but fundamentally there has always been an issue with the institution and the family and that these two things uh, are they have to exist simultaneously and we expect these people to be public servants because that is what they are but they are a family they have their problems and it's very difficult to kind of walk that line if you see what I mean I mean in a big way though the palace is now being a accused of a double standard because, you know, the, the family is saying this is going to be treated as a private matter, but yet on Meghan's bullying accusations, they're opening an investigation. Uh, that was seen as something that needed to be dealt with on kind of a professional level, talking to members of staff. Meghan isn't seen as a member of staff. She's seen as a private member of the family. That's what the royal family would say. But the palace isn't really dealing with this thing head on by giving out this statement. It's short. It's sweet in their view. They want to move on. But there are big issues here. They need to hand... They need to deal with and they just haven't so far Lindsay they say that those conversations will be handled privately James our thanks to you and joining us now is ABC News Royals contributor and author Robert Jobson Robert thanks so much for joining us I want to start off by rereading the Queen's statement the whole family is saddened to learn the full extent of how challenging the last few years have been for Harry and Meghan the issues raised particularly that of race are concerning while some recollections may vary they are taken very seriously and will be addressed by the family privately Harry Meghan and Archie will always be much loved family members uh, certainly some interesting phrases to unpack there. Perhaps most curious is probably, while some recollections may vary. Uh, what do you think of Her Majesty's statement today and the reporting that she was initially reluctant to sign it? Well, I think it was a dignified statement, given the circumstances of how this uh, was revealed. I think um, they've been pushed into a corner, and it is a very difficult position. And, because of us, obviously, both the issues of health, um, mental health, and race are hugely delicate issues that have to be uh, handled with, with extreme care and caution. The problem was, of course, is that uh, Meghan and Harry decided not to keep it within the family, and they revealed it on air um, to millions of people. So it's difficult because at this moment in time although harry heard the conversation that he reported back to his wife his wife who first revealed it megan has not been party to this conversation other than what her husband has told us it's a second-hand conversation now it's clear that the, the problem they face now at the palace although they've they've issued this is that they have not been able to um say who the person is so therefore at the moment it does seem that if that person has made this statement and they are then protecting um the race the, the racist person that has made this comment they also um what i find damaging too is they haven't denied the comment but they haven't confirmed it either this moment this comment about varying re re recollections etc is not really satisfactory so and the fact that they say that they want to deal with it within the family, well, that's okay if it hadn't been revealed to millions of people. And we saw Prince Charles out in public today. You were there. What was the feeling like today? I imagine quite different than the usual royal engagements. Well, funnily enough, no, it was exactly the same as the usual 
royal engagements. So when I've covered uh, the Prince of Wales for many years, I've written a biography of the Prince of Wales, and actually it was very much keep calm and carry on. Um, they, he obviously was aware the statement would be coming out after the engagement, which was actually, firstly, he went to an engagement where he was trying to encourage more people of colour and, and ethnic minorities where, in this country, where there's been a problem in terms of taking up the vaccination. I thought it was quite business as usual. I mean, I understand from people close to him that he feels a little let down too. You know, Harry says he feels let down, but you know, the, the comments that, after all, multi-millionaire Harry said about he was cut off by his family financially. It's not what I've heard. I mean, you know, there's a few things that are not quite accurate in the statements by Meghan and Harry that should be picked up on. Um, his father did support him with hundreds of thousands of dollars, actually. Um, and that's after he decided to leave the royal family. So I know that's a fact. I also... Um, think that the, the the claims and also the, the Prince Charles does take um, race issues very very seriously is deeply concerned about the, the statements that have been has, have been made I mean you know, he, I know very much so that he believes that diversity is, is a strength of our community and our society and far from it being a, a weakness and so you know he very much has spoken out for um, the people of colour, Asian communities is, and so I know that that is the way he really does passionately feel. Was this pre-planned or was this reactionary to visit this particular uh, location that was heavily diverse or a black population? Uh, I mean, I've heard that suggested on other networks. All the royal visits are pre-planned. You can't just turn up. Um, we had notification privately amongst the accredited correspondents such as myself over a week ago that this was taking place. And to be fair to the Prince of Wales and, and, uh, and the, the Duchess, they had no idea what was going to be said in the document, in the, um, uh, uh, the interview with Oprah a week ago. This was, this was organised uh, some time ago and actually that's when they announced it to the media privately. This would have been planned weeks, months ago actually. Understood. And lastly, last week the palace released a statement that they were investigating the bullying allegations against Meghan. But in today's statement, no mention of an investigation into Harry's allegations. Does that seem like a double standard? Wouldn't this response hurt the palace? Well, I mean, they're two different things. I think the reality is that you're looking at um, allegations being made by former members of staff. Who are on? Who are paid uh, members of staff? But if you like, as part of a corporation. Now that they, have, the palace, as part of a corporation, has a responsibility, like, every, like anybody, any big corporation, to their staff members. Uh, and and then, then when there's been allegations of bullying, they have to look into those. What they're dealing with here with Meghan and Harry is what they would regard as probably more of a family issue, which is nothing to do. With, there's not necessarily to do with the corporation as such. I think there's been a misunderstanding on a lot of levels like that because the Duchess, Duke and Duchess were members of the royal family. They weren't this is why I didn't understand why the, 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 the issues that Megan said she faced over mental health when she went to HR. Why would she go to HR? She's not a, a member of staff. She, she would have simply gone to the royal doctor the royal doctor, all very privately would have simply referred her to a, a psychiatrist or a mental health practitioner. All of that would have been extremely private. The only reason we knew that the, both Prince Charles or, well, actually, we, we only knew that Prince Harry had had uh, help with counselling is because he decided to reveal it himself. All matters of mental health, health are, are actually not reportable. Understood. Uh, Robert Jobson, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And one last royal note, Prince Charles got emotional earlier today during a conversation with a man at a vaccination center in the UK. The man could be heard speaking about someone who died in a hospital. A reminder that this royal riff is happening as the world continues to face a deadly pandemic. Still ahead here on Prime, the flood watches and warnings across the Hawaiian Islands and the residents trapped by rising waters. Could lawmakers in Congress possibly take up the Free Britney movement? And we take a look at the shocking prevalence of domestic violence by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, iconic songwriter Carol King taking up the Dolly Challenge and creating her very own song after her vaccination. It's not too late, and you really are going to make it. You're going to be so...
I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. This week, as we recognize International Women's Day, the World Health Organization released an alarming new report finding that violence against women worldwide, quote, remains devastatingly pervasive and starts alarmingly young. And the pandemic has made this even worse. We take a closer look by the numbers. Globally, one in three women are subjected to physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. That's about 736 million women around the world, according to the WHO and its partner organizations. And this violence starts early. One in four women who have been in a relationship will have experienced intimate partner violence by their mid-20s. 16% of girls and women ages 15 to 24 who have been in a relationship over the past year have been victims of intimate partner violence during that time. And while intimate partner violence is by far the most prevalent form of violence against women, worldwide, 6% of women report being sexually assaulted by someone other than a husband or partner. And finally, the study finds that violence against women is, quote, endemic in every country and every culture, but it disproportionately affects women in low and lower middle income countries where the prevalence can be as high as one in two women. Still lots to get to here tonight on Prime to fight over representation in higher education. Dr. Cornell West explains why he left Harvard and why he believes tenure is not given equally to those who deserve it. And why one of the first dogs, well, they're now in the doghouse for what they did. But first, to look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richie. We taught all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Oh! 
Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. The FBI late this afternoon releasing this new video, the person who planted two pipe bombs the night before the Trump rally riot at the Capitol. The FBI officially confirming those pipe bombs placed at the Democratic and Republican National Committee headquarters could kill. These pipe bombs were viable devices that could have been detonated, resulting in serious injury or death. Since January 5th, you may have noticed changes in someone you know. It could be bragging about what they did while on Capitol Hill, following this story very closely, or exhibiting an unusual emotional response to the reporting of this story. The skaters say both devices appeared fully functional, but fortunately, neither went off. And the FBI interested in where those attached kitchen timers came from. Authorities also releasing images of the suspect's Nikes in hopes it will trigger a lead. Many of the Hawaiian islands getting drenched right now. At least 13 inches of rain have forced evacuations on Maui. State of emergency issued in Maui after a dam was breached. Water, as you can see, rushing into the streets, turning them into rivers. Nearby residents fled quickly, seeking higher ground. Many folks fear possible mudslides. Evacuation shelters have now been opened at two locations, and the flash flood warning has also been issued. The Free Britney movement has made it to the halls of Congress. Two Republican lawmakers are asking for a hearing to examine potentially unjust conservatorships, citing Britney Spears. In a letter to House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler, Representatives Jim Jordan and Matt Gates cite the pop star's ongoing legal battle, writing, Given the constitutional freedoms at stake and opaqueness of these arrangements, it is incumbent upon our committee to convene a hearing to examine whether Americans are unjustly trapped in conservatorships. The request comes at the heels of a new documentary examining Britney Spears' legal arrangement. Since 2008, Spears has been in a conservatorship overseen by her father, Jamie. He insists the arrangement is to her benefit. Well, President Biden's two German shepherds are now back home in Delaware after a biting incident. The White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says a major, which is the name of one of the dogs, caused a minor injury to someone who was unfamiliar to him. The victim was not identified. Psaki says the dogs were still getting used to the new surroundings and people. She insists that Champ, the other dog, and Major's move to Delaware was pre-planned to coincide with the First Lady's trip to the West Coast. Uh, the spokesperson says dogs will return to the White House soon. 
Aside from avoiding trees, a skier was also avoiding this. A bear caught on camera chasing a skier down a slope in Romania. The group of skiers tried to scare off the approaching bear, but to no avail. The next best option, to ski away. But the bear decided to chase after, until later wandering away. Last month in Alaska, a skier had to be airlifted by the Coast Guard after being mauled by a bear. Luckily in this instance, everyone was safe with a story for Opry Ski. And now to the high-profile dispute over tenure at Harvard that's led star African-American studies and divinity school professor Dr. Cornell West to leave the university. He'll join Union Theological Seminary in New York as a tenure professor this summer, and Professor West joins us now. Dr. West, thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. Thank you so very much, and congratulations on your new book, Stay This Way Forever. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Now, you've held tenured positions in the past at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and you've been back at Harvard in non-tenured position for the past five years, uh, but the university declined your re recent request to be considered for tenure again. Were you given reasons for why you were denied this time, and, and why did you decide to leave rather than pursue your case? Well, it's a complicated case in the sense that it was a tenure review that they had denied, and I think they've changed their mind now, but it's too late. And uh, I, I don't really know exactly why. They said maybe age, but no, that couldn't be the case. I'm giving a gift for lectures in Scotland. Uh, it, could be, it couldn't be academics because I was a university professor at Harvard and Princeton. I was tenured at Yale 37 years ago, so it doesn't make any sense. And so my hypothesis is it might have something to do with politics, but I mean, I'm deeply concerned about the Israeli occupation and Palestinian plight and predicament, and that's not a popular issue. And, and, and I think we have to have a serious, robust, uninhibited conversation about that issue that's respectful, it's not anti-Jewish, but it's not anti-Palestinian either. So that I'm concerned about that issue, but I'm concerned about issues across the board. It's got to be intellectual freedom. Well, you say you're concerned about that issue. Are you concerned that potentially your support for the Palestinian cause may have cost you tenure? I, I, I wonder. I wonder about that. I know. I know. If there's other cases recently at Harvard where there's been very high quality scholars. In fact, there was a Jewish uh, Israeli woman, one of the finest scholars who was very critical of the Israeli occupation, she also was denied a tenure position. So that I, 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 I hope that there's not a, a pattern setting in that uh, we can't have a serious discussion of this issue. And as you know, it's very delicate because as soon as you raise the issue, you're accused of being anti-Semite, anti-Jewish, and so forth. And, uh, and for me, I, I'm, I'm fundamentally committed to Jewish humanity and, and a fight against uh, uh, any kind of anti-Jewish hatred. But I am just as committed to Palestinian humanity as I am, am to Jewish humanity. You talked just now about a few things that are worth fighting for for you. Why was this not worth fighting for? It's because it, it was too late. The public outcry has been magnificent among students and among fellow citizens and people all around the world. Harvard was starting to shift. But you see, I don't believe that respect can be coerced. I don't believe that respect can be uh, forced. So it was too late, and I wanted to go back to the great Union Theological Seminary. I wanted to go back to the place where I can stretch out the legacy of James Cone and James Washington and James Forbes and Rhino Niebuhr and Paul Tillich and Beverly Harrison and Randy, Robert Handy. Those. That's, that's very much where my heart, mind, and soul really is. Last week, the, the president of Harvard was quoted as saying at a faculty meeting that he was firmly committed to the success of our black faculty. Do you feel, feel that that was an accurate statement? Well, I think that uh, Brother Larry, he, he, he's got a, a good heart. He just has to have more spine. He's got to translate his words into action. He's got to translate is black administrators. He's got some wonderful black administrators at the top, but you have to translate it into impact on faculty and especially on the students. And uh, I think that's a process and we just have to keep the pressure on him. But he, he, he said that, let's make sure he says what he means and means what he says. And I, I'm, I'm in solidarity with all who will make sure we got high quality black folk, brown folk, indigenous folk, women, gay, lesbian and trans and non-binary. And we got to make sure, in fact, that uh, 
they remain rooted in integrity. They remain rooted in decency. It's not just a matter of skin pigmentation. It's a matter of black folk who are committed to integrity and honesty and decency and intellectual freedom and holding off the pressures of greed and conformity and callousness and indifference toward the suffering of others. It, Dr. West, is there a policy for tenure? In other words, are there clear boxes that you have to check or is there a lot of subjectivity? I think it's both. I think there are impersonal procedures and processes, but in the end, it's a judgment only of the president and only of the provost. Uh, you got faculty and an ad hoc committee, but at Harvard, it's only the president and the provost who in the end decide. And it's there where you can end up with some subjective uh, 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 elements in any judgment, and that's just being human. That's just being human. And, and let's just talk lastly, more broadly, about faculty diversity. As you know, Harvard has faced criticism in recent years for denying tenure to other African-American and Latino scholars, and diversity in the teaching ranks is an issue across all of academia, really. What's the most important thing that can happen to improve the process so that more diverse professors make it into tenured faculty ranks? And, and do you think that Harvard is doing something wrong on this front? Well, you know, the problem is in the higher levels of professional managerial sites, be it Silicon Valley, be it Wall Street, be it Harvard, too many of those sites still look like the National Hockey League. So all the talk about diversity in the world, if it doesn't translate on the ground, then in the end, we've still got not just a lot of work to do, we got to quit being dishonest and we got to be more vigilant in terms of ensuring there's high quality black folk. And when they're there, you don't disrespect them. You don't devalue them, that they have grand contributions to make just like anybody else. Dr. Cornell West, we thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. I salute you, my dear sister. Thank you. And when we come back, how did a show about the British countryside and a veterinarian become so popular? Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burn. 
And finally tonight, the unlikely hit TV show that's bringing our Maggie Ruley to the farm to live out her childhood dream. <gasps> well, hello. Like many young kids, I grew up wanting to be a veterinarian, which is how as a now 30 something year old woman, I ended up knee deep in sheep on a farm just outside London. Hi. <laughs> We definitely are having a moment, aren't we, Connie? You are just giving the best sheep cuddles. Hello. Oh, she is precious. Hello. In my mind are thoughts of James Harriet, the countryside vet with a gentle manner and soft touch. His books from the 70s, a favorite of mine growing up, have now found a new life on the small screen. Did you read the books? I did read the books and um, I watched this new series and, and I actually really loved it. Somehow in a modern TV world filled with drug lords, murderers and mayhem, all creatures great and small, a miniseries about this calm old timey vet from the 1930s is standing out. <laughs> Oh God. Set in the Yorkshire Dales, a bucolic slice of the English countryside, the show is raking in glowing critical reviews from all over. You, know, you say never in a million years you thought you'd be watching and reviewing all creatures great and small. And in your, your review, you write, suddenly there was nothing I wanted to watch more than this gentle show with its low stakes plotting, lush scenery, adorable animals, and ensemble of fundamentally nice people. What was it that made you drawn to this? It was such a relief. I literally watched most of the season on the day of the, the insurrection in Washington, D.C., and I had the news on, and at a certain point, I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't believe that this was happening, and so I kept putting on the, the nice man takes care of the couch show. Already a smash hit in Britain during lockdown, becoming Channel 5's most watched show in years. By the time the series made its way across the pond, Americans were desperately in need of its relief. I think we all are living in a world that feels very, very out of control to us. We, at the moment, the pandemic has engendered um, a feeling of anxiety, uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen next. And I think we all are hankering after some form of solidity and certainty. James Harriet's continued success over 50 years proves there's just something about this solid and certain life that connects with people. Although as I found out, today's farm life is full of surprises that, well, I'll pack a punch. Hello! Look at your mop of hair. Amy Saran is a modern day James Harriet, having spent the last decade working as a vet on the English countryside. I feel like James Harriet looked very snazzy when he's in the field. I mean, it's no suit and tie like our friend James, but I think we look dashing. Yeah. All right, so dashing, maybe overselling it, but we are ready for action. So this is snout. Oh, look at them get in there. I know. They are hungry. They love Unlike in Harriet's time, nowadays vets have relatively new technology to help them get up close and personal. Hi. Hello, friend. Using an ultrasound on Miss Betty here, Amy delivers the exciting news. A little baby alpaca is on the way. Oh, Betty, congratulations. Oh, you will be seeing you. What are the biggest differences between, you know, large animal veterinarian medicine today versus the 1930s when, when James Harriet was out here? Fundamentally, it is the same. We are relied upon to provide like an animal health service. There are more women in agriculture now, <laughs> um, and and indeed farm vetting. I mean, it's it's still not what I would call diverse enough, but. Farm, farm vetting has opened up to a lot more people than we would traditionally have, have associated with farm vetting. And Amy shows me how to dive right in. I can teach you how to tip a sheep if you want. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Something every gal must know. Sheep flipping is, well, <laughs> exactly what it sounds like. You will control her a little bit with your legs. Oh, okay. You give her a sort of a big old koala hug. Yeah, here. Push that head round and then lift that foot up. Oh, oh here we go. So. You're doing it. Did I do it? You did it. Oh my God, well, Connie, I think this is more just Connie being the most amazing sheep ever. <laughs> She's so chill. Connie, did so, we just become best friends? <laughs> I think I'm in love. I think I'm in love. As Connie and I have our moment, I realize that perhaps it's this bond and the intense but slow life on a farm that draws us to all creatures great and small. We, we've been trapped physically and emotionally, you know, for almost a year now. And also just our, our lives right now are so difficult and so hectic to have this very peaceful and happy thing about nice people. I, you know, it's like, it's like Liz Lemon once said. I want to go to there. 
a show that gives us a place where the little kids inside of us can be vets and the adults can welcome the escape. <laughs> Maggie Ruley, ABC News, London. Maggie seemed right at home, life there on the farm, our thanks to her. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, a nun on her knees pleading with police in Myanmar not to harm protesters amid the violent crackdown following a military coup. Two men also on their knees appearing to be praying alongside her. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great night.